And what I see in Charlotte is a thirst and a hunger for the supernatural and for transformation that God is committed to fulfilling himself. In every word that we have been connecting during this season, we have been focusing on the benefits and the importance of stewarding relational resources appropriately. If you remember, say yes. yes. Okay, good. And today, we're going to talk specifically from the perspective of those who recognize and agree that relationships are resources given to us by God. Today, we will position ourselves to be able to go from the stepping off point <clears throat> where we recognize and agree that God expects a return on the relational investments that he has given to us. And the stepping off point for us is that we agree and accept that everything that God is doing in the earth will be done through relational connections. If you believe it, say yes. yes. But before <clears throat> I talk about all of that, I want to talk about serial killers. Wow. Yeah, I'm going to talk about serial killers. And I'm going to get deep in a little bit, but right now I'm going to talk like about real murderers. <laughs> okay? Here's what I want to do. Um, my wife is a true crime addict yeah my wife like she loves to watch true stories about people killing folk it's the truth okay and I know she's not the only one there has been a rise in true crime podcasts over the past like 10 12 years and my wife is really not a horror movie type of person she really doesn't like made up demented actions but if they actually chewed somebody she's in on that <laughs> and what I have found in almost 20 years of marriage, we'll be married 20 years in July. I'm so excited about that. I'm, I'm excited about that. What I have recognized is that whatever she likes, I like. Just so you know, husbands, whatever, whatever they like, you better figure out some affinity for it. So as I'm watching these first 48 and snapped and I remember one time we had a whole weekend where we shut in and wasn't no Netflix and chill it was snap and chew that's what it was we ate stuff and watched like oh I mean to the point Terrence where I was a little concerned I'm sending text messages to my family like if it go down y'all know who did it I'm just saying As I watch these serial killers, what I find are the most terrifying serial killers yeah. are the ones who hide in plain sight. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm preaching now. We're already here. The ones who give us the most paranoia, the ones who capture our attention are the ones who are right there with us every day. They live in the same neighborhood as their victims. They are cordial and affable. Yep. The thing that struck me about Jeffrey Dahmer is that he was good looking and kind of handsome. The thing that struck me about, uh, what's the other guy? Not Ted Bundy. Uh, there was another one. I can't remember his name right now. But he was so handsome that people just assumed that everything was okay with him. I mean, he literally was taking people into his apartment. Locking them in boxes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The thing that was most terrifying is that his neighbors never knew. They don't look like serial killers. And I will tell you that the people in those environments 
even made acquaintances with them, never fully realizing that they were preying upon the ones that they were acquainted with. And I will tell you that today we are going to uncover a serial killer in our midst. We're going to uncover a serial killer that we have been acquainted with. One that is so close to us that if we look to the left or look to the right, we will find proximity to where this serial killer has already done his work. We're going to talk through relational serial killers today. The reason why I want to talk about serial killers is because we understand that relationships are resources. They are to be stewarded by God and that everything that God is going to do in the earth will be done through our ability to relate appropriately. However, there is one thing, one serial killer to relationships that can threaten everything that God is seeking to do through you and I in this season. If you believe it, say yes. The greatest serial killer of relationships is sinister. The greatest serial killer of relationships is seductive. The greatest serial killer to relationships, according to Christ, is inevitable. The serial killer is called offense. Yeah. The question for us today is how do we handle offense in relationships in a way that honors God? How do we handle offense in relationships in ways that will allow the relationship to survive? How do we handle offense? Turn to Matthew chapter 18. Matthew, the 18th chapter. I am reading from the New Living Translation. I want you to read from whichever translation helps you understand. And I want you to look specifically at verse 15. Matthew 18 and 15. If this is Jesus talking, another believer sins against you. Go privately and point out in the New Living Translation the writer writes the word offense. If the other person, Jesus writes, says, listens and confesses it, you have won that person back. Highlight that in your Bibles. It's going to be important in a couple moments. Look at Matthew chapter 18, verse 16. But if you are unsuccessful, take one or two others with you and go back again. So that everything you say can be confirmed by two or three witnesses. If the person still refuses to listen, take your case to the church. And if he or she won't accept the church's decision, treat that person as a pagan or as a corrupt tax collector. I want to talk this morning about offense but I want to talk from the perspective of those who have been offended. Not those who are committing the offense. We're going to get to that in a second. I don't want to just focus on those who have been uh, innocent bystanders in someone else's reign of offending actions. But I want us to position ourselves to hear from the perspective of the one who has been offended. Skip up to Matthew chapter 18 verse 7. Scroll up on your devices. Go up a couple verses. And in Matthew 18 7, Jesus is laying the groundwork. He begins to share with us a truth that is connected to the nature of offense. He says, what sorrow awaits the world because it tempts people to sin. This is the New Living Translation. It says, temptations are inevitable, but what sorrow awaits the person who does the tempting. Now, in the King James Version, Matthew 18 and 7 says a little differently 
the word temptation is translated here as offense. Matthew 18, 7, and the King James V says, Woe unto the world because of offenses. For it must needs be that offenses come. But woe to the man by whom the offense comes. In Luke chapter 17, verse 1, again, in the King James Version, Jesus begins to reiterate this same point. He is saying it is impossible but that offenses will come. And in each of these verses, the word offense is translated in the Greek, scandalon. It is the word that allows us to get our English understanding of the word scandal. And in Matthew 18, the word offense specifically refers to a stick of bait for a trap. It is a snare. It is a stumbling block. It is the thing that has been set to trip us up. Offense is the trigger more properly of the trap. Think about uh, in a Hanna-Barbera cartoon or think about any time you have seen a wildlife series, normally an animal trap has a bait. Something that will draw the victim into that geographic location, the physical proximity of the thing that will entrap us. And here in Matthew 18, the word offense specifically is connected to the thing that triggers us to fall. I want you thinking about offense as a trigger for our stumbling. I want you thinking about offense in Matthew 18, both for the one who is offended and for the offender as something that has been sent to cause us to fall. Something that has been sent to cause us to put into a negative cause and effect relationship into motion. It is the thing which traps the one who was going along their way. I will tell you that many of us stumble into offense, not looking to be offended. You didn't wake up this morning thinking that your spouse was going to say something crazy out the clear blue. You didn't wake up this morning thinking that your neighbor was going to say something that would cause you to be offended in an instant. I don't think you had preconceived notions before you were offended about saying, I'm going to set something in my own path in order to cause me to stumble and fall. But the sinister nature of offense is that the unsuspecting victim has every intention of doing the right thing. But the nature of offense is that it causes us to stumble and fall. Here's what I will tell you. The reason why offense is so sinister is because we are acquainted with it, particularly when we feel justified in our feelings of being offended. Yeah, it's one thing for us to catch an attitude because we had a bad day, but there's something altogether different for someone to encroach upon our peace, to encroach upon the good days that we are having, to encroach upon the posture that we have taken to submit ourselves to the king. It is offensive to us for someone to enter into our space of peace, which is why when we are offended, we feel justified in our actions after the offense. I didn't do anything to you. I was trying to do right by you. And you betrayed my trust. You misinterpreted my motives. You took actions against progress in my life. You lashed out to me in ways that were not connected to my original intent. Many times the one who has the biggest problem with the fence is the one who has been offended because we are looking for some level of justice and justification. It's hard to get over a fence when you were the one trying to repair the breach. But here... 
In Matthew 18, we find that Jesus' words are specifically for the one who has been offended. And it's important for us to understand why we who have been offended, we who have been done dirty, we who have had people misunderstand us have a responsibility to rectify the offending issue. It's important because we must go back to point number one for the last three or four Sundays that relationships are resources and God expects us to steward them appropriately. Here is the big idea. This is the one thing I want you to remember today. Write this down. We must protect God's investment in relationships by understanding how to handle offense. If you and I are going to see God's will enacted in our lives, if you and I are going to be launched into destiny and purpose, if you and I are going to be transformational agents in our city and in our region, if your bloodline is going to be shifted, if your marriage is going to be improved, if your relationship with your children are going to be God-honoring, we must recognize how we handle offense. It's critical. Because it is the thing that can tear God's kingdom down from the inside out. Matthew 18, verse 15, Jesus begins to lay out the playbook. He says, if another believer sins against you, go privately and point out the offense. I want you to recognize what's happening here. Because Jesus in Matthew 18, 15 is not talking to the offender. No, don't read past it too quickly. Yeah, he's talking to the one who has been done dirty. Yeah, he's talking to the one who is trying to do the right thing. He's talking to the one who was minding their own business. And because of someone else's human frailty, they are now trapped. In the jail of offense, he says, if another believer sins against you, go privately and point out the offense. It's critical to notice who Jesus is talking to. He's not talking to non-believers in Matthew 18, 15. No, he's talking to believers. And here is the first point I want us to recognize that even though we are saved, sanctified, Holy Ghost filled and fire baptized, looking for Jesus and running for our lives, we've got to recognize that we are also human. Yes. Yes. Just because we speak in tongues doesn't mean that our tongues can't speak hurtful things. I want to smack this in the face because the church house is a safe place and a safe haven. It is built to be a refuge. However, it is a trauma ward. And if we come to church expecting to uh, find a space free of offense, we will be gravely disappointed. And I don't want to point to anyone specifically, but I want you to think about how many times you left the church because somebody did you wrong. I want you to think about how many times you pulled back your participation in ministry activities because somebody didn't know how to treat you. I want you to think about how many times you have been in a church environment within a ministry context and you decided that it was not safe for you because of offense. Jesus is saying to those of us who have been offended, if and when, you find yourself in a conflict with another believer, go to them and point it out. I will tell you that your adversary is tight in here. Woo! It's all right. It's all right. It's going to get good in a second, but I just want you to take a breath real quick. Come on, let's go. Real breathe in. Yeah, let it out. Oh, yeah. Breathe in real good. Yeah, let it out. I will tell you that deliverance is connected to the breath, the pneuma of God. Come on, breathe in one more time. Yeah, breathe in and let it out. Jesus gave the spirit of power to the disciples, and the Bible says he breathed on them and said, receive the Holy Ghost. One last time, breathe in. Let it out. Okay, let's do some more work. 
Jesus is saying in Matthew 18, 15, go to them and point it out. Can I tell you how many times I have been offended with someone and they had no idea I was offended with them? I'm talking about in my own house. I done played in my own mind. All the stuff. I've had conversations and retorts to their conversation with me. And they have no idea that I'm struggling right now. Jesus says if we are going to steward relationships appropriately, we must position ourselves to take a leadership posture and go for reconciliation. I will tell you that the greatest breeding ground of offense is silence. Yeah, it's like a cancer. It will spread to the recesses of our hearts because we have not articulated what is going on inside of us. Jesus says, go privately, privately, which means discretion is important. Here's why. Because we are human. Say, I'm human. And because we are human. We are it when we are in positions where people can see us, sometimes our ego can get the best of us. It's important to know people react differently in private than they do in public when confronted with their sin. Jesus says, go privately and point it out. Take your emotion and just sit it in the parking lot for a moment. And articulate the issue. And I will tell you, it's important for us to know how to do this because there will come a time where you and I will be on the other side of this scenario. And you will appreciate someone coming to you and saying, hey, listen, this thing that you said at this moment, you may not be aware, but I felt a way about it. Yeah, just so you know, this way we handled this situation, you may not be aware that it happened this way, but it triggered something in me and because whoo, I value relationship enough, because I recognize the power of relationship, I will not allow offense to kill something that is just being burst. So I'm going to go to you. It shows a level of value when you can go beyond offense and point to the higher value in relational connections. Here's why that's important. Because the goal of our reciprocating grace activity when we confront offense is to win them back. Look at verse 15. I can't get off of this one verse. Jesus says, if they listen and confess, you have won that person back. This slapped me in the face personally, because I know there are many times when I go to people, according to Matthew 18, I'm not thinking about winning them back, Jalen. <laughs> I'm thinking about winning my case. <laughs> there are many times when I go to somebody, I'm not thinking about winning them back. I just want them to repent to me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, I'm not considering myself the one who needs them. I just want you to know this is what happened. Now do something to rectify it. But Jesus says, listen, the focus of our conflict, which is healthy, is winning back the offender. What is it like for us to want to win back the ones who have hurt us? Smack me in the face. It required something of me to think, do I trust Jesus enough to do what he is saying? These words are in red in my Bible. This is not a suggestion. It is a template and a pattern. Reconciliation is the goal of confrontation in relationships, particularly 
when there has been offense. If you believe it, say yes. Look at verse 16. If you are unsuccessful, I'm going to tell you straight up, Cynthia, this is the part that I wrestle with. Jesus knows everything. Jesus is omnipotent and omniscient and omnipresent, which means he is in the past, in the present, and in the future at the same time. And Jesus could have definitely said, when they listen to you. Jesus, Mitch, could have easily said, if you do what I'm asking you to do, when they confess it. But he did not. He said, if. You mean to tell me I've got to employ this technique wondering if they're going to do the right thing? I've got to go to them with the best of intentions and pursue reconciliation and it might not work out for me? How is this the best way to handle this situation? Jesus. As you begin to read Matthew 18, your homework is to read the entire chapter. Matthew 18, Matthew 19. You will find that the disciples even say, Master, this is a hard thing. (laughs) Give us more faith. (laughs) Here's why this is important. He says, if you are unsuccessful, take two or three others and go back again. Because Jesus recognizes that the connections that we have are so valuable, but they are vulnerable. They are vulnerable because of our human nature. And what Jesus is trying to do is to remove from us a commitment, a connection, a soul tie, if you will, to the outcome. And he wants us only committed to obedience. Jesus doesn't care if they accept your apology. He just wants you to apologize. Jesus isn't really interested in Matthew 18, 15 through 17. If they change their pattern just yet, he is looking for what we are going to do as the ones who are offended. Why? Ask me why. Why? Because our hearts must be protected against harboring offense. Forgiveness is for the one who has been damaged or broken. Mm. Forgiveness is for the one who has offense committed against them. And we do not release forgiveness quickly because we think we are giving them something they do not deserve. Bitterness and unforgiveness. You have heard it said is like drinking poison and expecting the other party to die. You and I cannot afford, with all of the things that God has for us to be and do in the earth, we cannot afford to harbor offense in our hearts. Jesus is more interested in our obedience than our understanding of justice. Here's why. Jesus says in a parable, a farmer who has a hundred sheep and loses one will leave the 99 and go get the one. And when he finds the one who is lost, he will celebrate bringing back the one. Here's why this is important. Jesus is as committed to the person on the other end of the offense as he is to you. Which is why. You and I cannot be the purveyors of justice in this situation. You and I can't trust our hearts when offense has entered them. So we've got to trust the word of God and submit with willing obedience. Jesus says the onus is on the offended to drive for reconciliation. And the goal is to win back this person. So now that we have gone through understanding this serial killer, now that we have positioned ourselves to be able to separate ourselves from looking for justice to really seeking obedience in our own lives, the 
question you may ask is how. This is a hard thing. I want you to listen to how. Give me one second, John. Here's what I want to do. I don't want soft music just yet because um, I don't want to lighten this just yet. <laughs> here's, here's what I want to do. I want to give you some practical tips. Write these down. In the clear light of day, write these down. And then we're going to shift. And we're going to celebrate. All right, so I don't want soft music. I want like excited music. We'll do that in a second, all right? We finna jump and get excited. I'm gonna give you something to get excited about. Trust me, it's in here. <laughs> I'm gonna give you some practical tips and it's important for us to write these down now before we get into an offending situation. Here's why. It's hard for you and I to go find scripture when we have already entered into a conflict type situation. The streets say, if you stay ready, you don't have to get ready. Okay? Maybe it helps with the urban vernacular. I'm just saying. <laughs> write, write these down. Okay? Here's what I want you to do. Number one, look for and expect offense. Expect it. I don't care how saved and anointed they are. I can preach on this. <laughs> I don't care how many times they laugh and play around you. I don't care how many people they lay hands on and slay in the spirit. Look for and expect offense. It's coming. It's coming. In every relational interaction you have, clients and suppliers, customers and vendors, parents and children, spouses and friend groups, bosses and subordinates, offense is coming. Expect it to come. Don't avoid it. Know and learn how we must handle it. Look for and expect offense. Jesus says it is but impossible. In Luke 17, 1, that offenses but come. They're coming. Because you and I are human, somebody's going to say something crazy to you. <laughs> they might even live with you. <laughs> okay? Expect it. Don't be surprised. I cannot believe you save. You go to church. Don't be surprised. No clutching of the pearls. Expect it. And once it shows up, now position yourself to be active in how you handle it. Here's the second thing. You ready? Second thing we got to do, write this down. Write it like I'm saying it. Die to self and the flesh. Die to self. Kill carnal responses. Seek and destroy the flesh in your relational interactions. I want you positioning yourself to submit to the leadership of the Holy Spirit. You can do it. You can do it. The Holy Ghost is for more than tongues and prophetic words. It is the thing that leads us. Jesus said, I will send you a comforter to help you in all things. I want you to die to self and the flesh, and I want you leaning in to the spirit part of who you are, all right? And I want you to submit. We've got to be praying about this Matthew 18 process. I want you to submit to the words in red, even if you don't believe your pastor. <laughs> submit to what Jesus said. Take it up with him. I didn't write it. He did, okay? You ready for the next one? Say yes. Come on, let's breathe in. Come on, breathe in. Breathe out. We can do this. Breathe in. Breathe out. We can do this. Okay, ready? Write this down. Resist offense taking real estate in our hearts. Resist offense setting up shop in our hearts. The, the book of James says, submit therefore to God and do what? Resist the enemy and he will do what? Flee from you. Listen to me. When you are letting go of offense, you are not letting the offender off scot-free. Why? Jesus said in Matthew 18, woe to the one by whom it comes. 
he will deal with them. But you do not want him in a position to have to deal with you. Get out of the line of sight. And listen, I'm going to tell you something. Okay, real quick. We got to go. All right. Oh, yeah, we got to go. Let me tell you this. I grew up in a single parent household and my mom employed corporal punishment. You know what that is? Huh? We got whoopings. <laughs> okay. And we got whoopings, you know, not just with the hand, Jaden. We would get switches. Well, I grew up in the city. We didn't have no switches. My mom would take a belt. <laughs> like nunchucks. <laughs> like nunchucks. And the South is a little different. They would send you out to the tree and make you get your own switch. What kind of sadistic parenting? And if you bring back a small one, Oh, yeah, you got to bring the one that's flexible, though. That's right. Because if you bring a big old log, it's going to be worse. But let me tell you what happened. I have brothers and sisters. And, and many times, my, I'm, old, I'm the oldest, so my younger brother would antagonize me. And when he would get in trouble, I'm in the corner like, yes. I'm like a hype man, like, get him, mommy. Here's what I found out the hard way. When that belt is swinging, you got to get out of the room. Because if you're getting too close, looking at them getting dealt with, you might get hit yourself. Stay out of the way, out of the line of what God is doing in them. Deal with your own heart. Deal with what's happening in your own heart. Find ways to be submitted. Let Jesus handle justice. You handle obedience. Get out the way. That's grown folk business. It's not for us. Here's the last thing. I want you, write it down like this. Forgive fast. It's bad grammar, but it helps my point. Don't say quickly. <laughs> write, <laughs> write down forgive fast. We're the teachers in the house. I know I'm screwing it up. Okay? Forgive fast. Okay? Here's why. It's important for us to forgive quickly. All right? Here's why. Because we need forgiveness ourselves. Look at Ephesians chapter 4, verse 30. I'm walking through this. I'm going to give you something to excited about in a second, okay? We're going to play excited music. We're going to laugh and give, and we're going to go home. And you're going to have good brunch today. I speak in Jesus' name. You're going to have good brunch today. But we need to get these practical principles, okay? Because you have to do this, and you can do it. Ephesians chapter three, 4, verse 30. Do not bring sorrow to God's Holy Spirit by the way you live. Remember, he has identified you as his own guaranteeing that you will be saved on the day of redemption. Now look at verse 31. You get rid of bitterness. You get rid of rage. You get rid of anger, harsh words, and slander, and all types of evil behavior. Instead, be kind to each other. Be tenderhearted. Look at what it says in your Bible. Forgiving one another. Why? Because Christ has forgiven you. Write down Colossians chapter 3, verse 12. Write this down. It's important to recognize our posture as believers even when we have been offended. Look at verse 12 in Ephesians and Colossians chapter 3. Since God chose you to be the holy people he loves, look at me in my eyeballs. God loves you enough to tell you how to deal with offense. He looked, some of us have missed what God has for us because it came in an environment where someone offended us. He loves you and I too much to allow that to happen. You believe it? Say yes. yes. Okay, here we go. Let's move. He says, you must clothe yourselves with tenderhearted mercy, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Make allowance for each other's faults. Don't look at me. Look at the screen. Look at your Bible. 
so you can receive it in your eyeballs. Okay? Look at this. It says, forgive only the people who are not saved that offend you. Doesn't say that. Forgive the ones who offend you and apologize first. Doesn't say that. Forgive the ones who don't live with you when they offend you. Doesn't say that. Forgive, say anyone. Mm -mm, Come on, say it. Don't tiptoe on it. Say anyone. Anyone. We're doing real work today. (laughs) Forgive anyone who offends you. Why? Because you and I must remember that the Lord forgave you. So you must forgive others. It is our identity as those who are recipients of grace to be distribution centers of grace. It is our heritage. It is our spiritual identity and makeup. It's in our DNA as believers to release grace. In overwhelming measure, if you believe it, say yes. Colossians chapter 3 says, Above all, clothe yourselves with love, which binds us all together in perfect, say harmony. harmony. Now, I did all of that to get to this. Why should we do this? It's hard, Pastor Jeff. Why should we posture ourselves to be able to release forgiveness and resist offense even when it is inevitable. Why should we do this? Where are the benefits? Write this down. First benefit is true freedom. Freedom from offense means freedom from the prison of unforgiveness. You have never been free until your heart has been free from having somebody else control it with their actions. People crazy, just so you know. And you cannot avoid running up on their craziness. You cannot. But what type of freedom is available to us if their craziness does not change my disposition and posture to the king? What is it like to go to work with all the folk you work with? I'm talking about your co-workers on your job. And for all of that dysfunction to not land and settle inside of you, what is it like to live a life where we are able to be focused like lasers on God's purpose, even in environments that are toxic? I'm not saying be toxic. I'm saying be a a thermostat instead of a thermometer. I want to tell you that true freedom is connected to our ability to be free from unforgiveness. You believe it? Say yes. Yes. Here's the second benefit. We do not have demonic snares influencing our actions. Write it down. Why we want to be free from offense is that we protect ourselves from having demonic snares influence our actions. We stop The progress of the cancer of unforgiveness and offense. It's a cancer. It will spread through a church. It will spread through a family. It will spread through a work environment. It will spread through a business and a friend group like wildfire. The benefit we have is that it stops with us. Third thing. Write this down. Unity unfettered. Unfettered unity is a benefit. And you and I will release the power of unity. We release the power of unity. Look at this. Turn to John chapter 17. Jesus is about to leave the earth. And as he is preparing himself to leave, he prays for those who are here. I want you to read the whole prayer of Jesus in John 17. But as he is going, he does not pray for biblical interpretation from them. He doesn't pray that they postured themselves to be able to cast out more demons. Jesus doesn't pray for them to build churches all over the world. Nope. Jesus prays for unity. Look at John chapter 17, verse 9. He says, my prayer is not for the world but for those you have given me, 
because they belong to you. All who are mine in John chapter 17, verse 10, belong to you, and you have given them to me, so they bring me glory. Now, I'm departing from the world, but they are staying here. I'm going to you. You have given me your name. Now protect them by the power of your name. So they will be what? United. Say united. United United just as we are. Skip all the way down to verse 20. I'm praying not only for these disciples, but also for all for all who will ever believe in me through their message. I pray that they will be what? One. Just as you and I are one, you, as you are in me, Father, I am in you. And may they be in us so that the world will believe you sent me. Look at verse 22 in John 17. I have given them the glory you gave me. So they may be what? One. one. You got glory from God so that we can per be purveyors of oneness in the earth. The church is to be the model and the example for building unity in the earth. The Bible says, I am in them, in verse 23, and you are in me. May they experience such perfect what? Unity. That the world will know that you sent me and that you love them as much as you love me. Everyone standing. Unity releases power and blessing. And the reason why we got to push against offense is because it works against the unity that is the vehicle for the blessing of Jesus Christ in the earth. You can play the soft music now. <laughs> so here's what I want you to recognize. Unity is our responsibility. The ones who have been offended have a responsibility to respond in ways that build unity. Amen. Unity is not weak. It is powerful. Unity is not the punk's way out. Unity, can I tell you, clap back, feels good in the moment, does not build unity. Can I tell you, getting it off your chest feels good in the moment, does not build unity. Can I tell you that posturing yourself to be able to uh, protect yourself from future impacts does not build unity, it restricts it. Here's why this is important. In Acts chapter 2, those of us who are Pentecostal know this by heart. Acts 2 and 1, on the day of Pentecost, when it was fully come, they were all with what? On one accord. Woo! And in one place. And when they were on one accord, then a wind came in. As of a rushing mighty wind. Uh-uh, you missed it. You think unity is passive. I am telling you, unity is the vehicle for the power of God being moved in the earth. You and I have been sold a lie that says unity restricts us. I am telling you that according to Acts chapter 2, unity is the thing that frees us. Psalm 133 says, brethren, how good it is for brethren to dwell together in what? Unity. Unity is the precious ointment on the head that runs down to the beard, even Aaron's beard. And it goes down to the skirts of his garment. And as the dew of Hermon, and as the dew of that, those that were descended upon the mountains of Zion, unity is a blessing that runs from the top down. Why? Psalm 133 and 3 says, For the Lord has commanded the blessing there in the place of unity so here's what I want you to do I want us to posture ourselves to take on the mantle of unity yeah I want you to be proud of your heritage and your inheritance to resist the cancer of offense I want you to be able to be faithful enough in God to trust that he is good enough to protect us even when we are wounded by those we are connected to. I want us to posture ourselves 
to be transformation agents in the region. And that only happens when we resist offense. If you believe it, say yes. Lift your hands. In this moment, I want you to recognize the power that is available for us when we resist offense. But I know you need help. We need help in doing so. So all we're going to do is pray and receive what God has for us. And we will celebrate the unity and power, the blessing and the favor. We will celebrate the posture of the glory of God being placed upon us because we are accepting the responsibility to be purveyors of grace and forgiveness in the earth. Let's pray. Father, I thank you. Yeah. I thank you that you love us enough to allow us access to the truth of your word. I thank you, God, that you love us enough that you allow us the weaponry to resist the advancement of our adversary. I thank you, Jesus, that you love us enough to allow your power and your presence to inhabit our hearts so that we do not have room for offense to take hold. I thank you, Jesus, that marriages are going to be transformed from the inside out because of our ability to resist offense. I thank you, Jesus, that peers and subordinates, that co-workers and superiors, are going to mark us as the perfect men. They will mark us as the perfect women because we have been able to understand how you want us to deal with offense. Thank you, Jesus, that you love me enough not to let me be isolated. Thank you, Jesus, that you love me enough to let me be led by the Spirit. Thank you, Jesus, that you loved us enough to be able to allow us to accept your glory and your presence that is the vehicle for your power. Thank you you that deliverance is connected to our ability to handle offense properly. I great, I'm grateful for what you have done in my heart in this moment. Thank you that we can celebrate your power. Yeah. Thank you that we can celebrate your faithfulness. Thank you that we can celebrate your goodness in the earth. That you love us enough to allow us to be free from the jail of offense. If you believe that, put your hands together and give God some praise today. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.